Tonight we are um, starting a, a collection of talks entitled, Are You Okay? And for the next three weeks, we're going to take our time dealing with some, I think, very serious topics. Things like depression, things like anxiety. Uh, next Sunday, we're going to be talking around the subject of worry. Uh, on our third week, I'm going to be talking really about, I think, practical handles of how to increase the joy in your life, how to increase the happiness in your life. And I really believe that over the next three weeks, God's going to do something, not just in us corporately, but in you individually. And so I'd encourage you to be around for it. But tonight uh, might be one of the most serious messages I've ever given at VU. And so we're going to pray tonight that we would do so with a level of sensitivity, with the right heart to receive, and also uh, the right heart that as I, I give this message. And so uh, before we pray, and before we ask for God's help, let's look at 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1. And this is what the scripture says. It says, Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a message to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. You ever been to a place where you just say, enough is enough? That's where he's at. I've had enough, Lord. He said, take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. And all at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel Lord came back a second time. Everyone say a second time. second time. And touched him and said, get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And tonight, as we kick off this collection, Are You Okay? Uh, I felt very led tonight to speak on a tough subject, but one that I think that we need to get loud about in the church. And so tonight I've titled this message, The Suicide Deception. The Suicide Deception. Would you pray with me tonight all over this house that God would use this message to minister to people? Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that it's alive and active, Lord, that it's sharper than any double-edged sword. And tonight it's doing work on the inside of us. I pray now, Lord, as I begin to preach, Lord, that you would begin to show up in this room. Use my words, use these broken words, Lord, to heal people's hearts. And as the psalmist pray, let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Tonight, Lord, we believe that you're at work in our community. We're thankful for that. And we're believing, God, together the best really is yet to come. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. And if you believe it tonight, come on, all of God's people said. Yeah. Come on, all of God's people said. Amen. Come on, 6 p.m. mayhem. If you really mean it tonight, can you go ahead and give God a rowdy, crazy, illogical shout of praise? <laughs> I've had a challenging week. Uh, my iPhone died this week. <sighs> Two days without your iPhone and your salvation gets tested. I've seen some of you without a phone. You, you are not saved without that phone. Um, it's, it's, it's funny because uh, my phone, uh, you can't tell that it's broken on the outside. There, there's, no, there's no damage on it to, to the naked eye, at least. The screen's not cracked. Uh, uh, the edges are all normal. It looks kind of like the phone I bought from the store, but apparently something is taking place on the inside of the phone. And it was sort of a, a progressive decline. Uh, at first, the first thing that to go was that I stopped receiving text messages. Now, I didn't know I wasn't receiving text messages. It wasn't until the next day that I saw some people that said they text me. They say, yo, Rich, what's up? Are you blocking my calls? I said, I didn't even know you text me. They pulled up their phone to show me that they had sent text messages. I said, oh my goodness, something's wrong with my phone. The second thing that happened is I started trying to text people and it wouldn't go through. Like it's, It wouldn't send. It was green. It would say message failure. So finally, I picked up my phone. And I tried to call people. When I tried to call people, I would dial the number, but I could not make a connection. And coming around tonight's talk, I thought this is a picture so often what mental illness looks like. Yeah. See, mental illness is sometimes it's hard to detect because on the outside, 
People don't look broken. You don't see bruises and you don't see scratches and you don't see scrapes and people don't walk around in a big cast. And so you can't tell with the naked eye. The problem is that there's a malfunction on the inside. And so often the decline looks a lot like my phone, that the first thing that stops happening is that people stop receiving the good things that are coming their way. They can't interpret the blessings of God. They can't receive compliments. They can't receive joy from friends. The second part is, is that so often those that are depressed, you've been there before, it's like you try to cry out for help, but every time you try to speak up, you can't make a connection. So many times, depression, what it feels like is this, that I'm so afraid to share what's going on the inside because I'm afraid it might destroy you. So what I do is I bury it on the inside of myself only to destroy myself. (laughs) Depression in 2018 is the leading cause for suicide. And I just don't think we can stay silent anymore in church about this subject. I think the church needs to give the answers. The church needs to provide hope. The church needs to provide a pathway to Jesus. Depression is a complicated thing, yet it's one of the most common psychological challenges that we will all face at different times. One psychologist said about depression that it's the common cold to our emotions. And depression is is interesting because it's like this feeling of sorrow and gloom, but then it's also mixed with this slowing down of your life. It sort of stops you in its tracks. Anybody who's ever gone through depression would tell you that it's not just something in your mind, but rather it's something you feel in your body. As much as it's in your head, it's also in your stomach. And what's so strange about mental illness is that there is a stigma on mental illness. Have you noticed this, that so often... People that are struggling with areas of mental sickness that we're quiet about it, we're ashamed about it, and we've, we've come to this idea that somehow we are weak because of it. But I believe at VU Church, the time has come for us to remove this stigma. That stigma stops right at those doors because this ought to be the safest place in the world for you to go through your challenges. There really is little difference between mental illness and physical illness. And have you ever noticed that people with physical illness, they don't see it as a thing of weakness. Remember when you were younger and like you'd break your arm or break your leg? Remember you'd come into junior high school and you have a big cast on, you'd say, hey, I'm here. <laughs> and then what would you do? You'd have this big cast. You're like, can you sign my cast? <laughs> but, but people with mental illness, so often we're quiet about the fact that we see a therapist or a counselor. Yeah. We don't want anybody to know that we've been prescribed medication. And I want to make sure that at VU Church, we do our part to be loud and to remove this stigma. The church for so long has given shallow answers towards this area of depression and mental illness. We've narrowed it down and we've told you things like you should pray more. And if you would worship harder and if you'd go to church more, then your depression would leave. Don't get me wrong. I think depression can be spiritual, but just like physical illness, sometimes your depression and your mental illness, it requires you to see a doctor and get treatment, and there is no shame in doing so. Can I get a witness on a Sunday night? In fact, I want to be loud and clear as your pastor tonight. If you are in this room and you are struggling with depression, hear me loud and clear. It is not because you're not spiritual enough. So sick and tired of this lie. You're not spiritual enough. No, no, friends. Sickness is not weakness. Sickness is not because of sin. And sickness is not your identity. Come on, somebody. Go ahead and give a shout of praise and shame the devil while you're at it. It's okay to not be okay. It's just not okay to stay that way. We've got to fight back tonight. We've got to remove the stigma. We've got to get healthy. Tonight, I got one mission, and I'm being serious, but I got one mission, and my one mission is to try to push people tonight that are struggling alone to push you into community that you would speak up and you would let somebody know, I'm not okay. I'm no psychologist, and I won't pretend to be one, but as you begin to study mental illness, there are many different reasons why it's occurring, Yet some things are occurring in our nation in 2018 because of lifestyle choices. And there's just no denying that. Truth of the matter is, as our society has improved, other things have declined. 
I see three basic things that are causing depression to rise and even on the other side of that, suicide to rise. The first thing that we're struggling with in society is that we live in a comparison culture. It's just, we've never lived in a day like this before. I love social media, but social media is hurting some of you. I love social media. At one point, I used to call myself the Snapchat king. (laughs) Nobody else called me this. I just called myself that. (laughs) But social media, it's a tool. The question is, are you using the tool or is the tool using you? Because what's happening is that we live in a world today that we've never been more connected, but at the same time, we've never been more isolated. We live in a world today that we don't know how to engage with one another anymore. And the only way we know how to talk is with our thumbs. And what social media is doing is it's causing us to look at one another and we're all of a sudden taking our lowest moments and we're comparing them to people's highlight reels. And comparison always kills your contentment. People have never been so dissatisfied and people have never been so unfulfilled and people have lost out on their contentment because they're living their life comparing where they're at with where somebody else is. I never knew how unhappy I was until I discovered how happy you were. It's pretty hard to be grateful for your job while you're sitting in your cubicle on a Monday and you're scrolling through Instagram and you see your girlfriend, she's laying out in her bathing suit in Tulum and you go, oh my God, my life is awful. I should be in Tulum in my bathing suit. No, you should focus on your job and in due season, God will provide you with a vacation. I see it happen not just on the surface levels, but even in good spaces. And many times I'll get a chance to go to different churches and I'll get a chance to preach and pastors will come up to me and they've got good intentions and their heart is pure, but they'll say things like this, Rich, man, we're seeing all that God is doing in Miami and we're watching on Instagram all that God's doing at Voo Church and it's absolutely amazing. And I just hope one day God could do something amazing here. I say, you know what? You're right. God is doing something amazing at Voo Church, but please believe Instagram is a lie. Because we're not broadcasting our failures and we're not posting our challenges and we're not uploading all of our weaknesses. No, we're only showing you the good stuff. And just because we're only showing you the good stuff doesn't mean there's not some bad stuff that we're walking through. And the only way you're going to walk into amazing things is when you get your eyes off of the grass on the other side and you get focused where you are. You start getting focused where you are and you start discovering, wow, where I'm at is pretty amazing. So we live in this comparison culture. And for many of us tonight, we don't even know it, but it's it's sucking the life out of us. It's not just a comparison culture. It's also that we're living in a fatherless generation. We've now seen two generations pass where 50% of the marriages are breaking up and divorce is rampant and it's causing young boys and young girls to grow up in homes without a dad. Even in some homes where a dad is present, he is not engaged. And what we discover throughout the scriptures is that the father's role is to help shape the identity of their children. Hebrews talks all about this, that a father disciplines his children that he loves and he helps shape them. A father's role is twofold. It's to affirm and it's to correct. It's to encourage, but it's also to discipline. And in 2018, people are having a major identity crisis. We've never been louder about identity. And at the same time, we've never been more confused about our identity. Would you believe that 63% of all youth suicides, they come from a fatherless home? 90% of all youth runaways, a fatherless home. 70% of the men in the prison system in America come from a fatherless home. I am so thankful for a God tonight that if we are in Christ Jesus, he declares, I am a father to the fatherless and I will walk with you. And whatever you're missing on earth, your heavenly father, he can fill in the gaps. This is why we need a community, because we need some men in this room to rise up and say, I'll be a dad to you. I might only be five more years older than you, but I'll be a spiritual dad. I'll be a foster father for you. I'll help shape who you are. You're a child of God. It's not just a comparison culture. It's not just a fatherless generation. It's that we live in a narcissistic nation. 
You want to know who God is in America? It's self. We are the selfie generation. Not enough room in the frame for anyone other than me. Because what's happened to us is that we're so self-absorbed. We've taken the focus off of other people and we're definitely not looking out. We're definitely not looking up. And therefore, all we do is look in. And our selfishness gives way to a sabotaging of the enemy that he literally begins to put in toxic thinking into our life. I mean, this is a narcissistic nation. And listen, my style is not one to sit up on a stage and like correct culture. Like it's just not who I am. And it's not our church, by the way, either if you're a guest. Our church, we love our city. Our church invades our city. Our church invades culture. We would rather change culture from within it rather than sitting on the side going, you guys are all messed up. But we must know why it is that we're facing certain things. And you just look around our culture, it's narcissistic. Politics, it's self-absorbed. The arts are self-absorbed. Entertainment, self-absorbed. When was the last time you went on to Apple Music and looked at the top 10 songs in America? Every song is all about me, 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 me. I'm the man, I'm the best. Yo, I'm on top of you, I'm better than you, I'm the man. That's the whole thing. One of the number one songs in 2018 came from an artist named Lil Pump. I'm not that old. <laughs> Song's called Drug Addicts. My whole crew's drug addicts. <laughs> like, like, I know I'm getting older, but when did it become cool to be a drug addict? Let me preach to you for a minute. It's not cool to be a drug addict. How do I know? Ask a drug addict. My whole crew's drug addicts. What? We've got multiple artists in our generation singing about putting melodies, putting beats to the idea of suicide, dreaming about suicide fantasizing about suicide, plotting suicide, singing about suicide. It's no wonder that we see suicide on the rise. And the thing with suicide is that it's so deceiving and it's spreading like wildfire. It's not just my assumption, it's a fact. Suicide is contagious. In fact, it's called the Werther effect. You can go back and you can check it out, but in 1774, this man by the name of Goethe, he came out with a book and the book was called The Sorrows of Young Werther. And the story is about a man who's in love with this girl, but the girl doesn't love him back. So he takes a pistol and he puts it to his temple and he shoots himself and he dies. And as the book was released, people started to read the story and other men started to copycat suicide what Werther did. So much so that they had to ban the book so people would stop repeating the behavior. Research shows us that when public suicides occur, that suicide rate increases. When Marilyn Monroe took her life at that time, the suicide rate went up by 12%. Wow. I lived in Tacoma, Washington, not far from Seattle. I was a Nirvana fan, although my parents did not know. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember Kurt Cobain taking his life. And I remember the ripple effects in that town as other young people said, all right, I need to end my sadness the same way. Wow. And I came tonight to challenge some people and I came tonight to plead with some people. There are better ways to kill your sadness. Let me tell you what suicide is. Suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. There are better ways. Suicide, you know what it's like? It's like putting, taking a bomb to a wasp nest. It leaves an irreversible mark, and it's not necessary. It does irreversible work, and it doesn't just affect the thing that it kills, but rather the people around it, they are destroyed also. And I'm just begging you tonight, I want to say this as loud as I possibly can, you don't have to die to end your pain. Yeah. 
You have more to live for. The one thing I know about emotions is that they change. One hour from right now, you will not feel the same way. And I want to encourage you tonight that you might be in your darkest moment. You might be going through hell and high water, but I want to prophesy over your life. It is always too soon to quit. You have a reason to live. God declares your best days are in front of you. We love you. You don't have to do this. Suicide is... It's deceiving. And it lies to us, and it says it's going to solve our problems. And I just know in a room this size, in this city that we live in, there are people that are struggling in a deep way. Once again, I got one mission. I'm going to take another 20 minutes to keep trying to get to this one mission. That one mission is just trying to get some people to speak up and say, I'm, I'm not okay. And if you're here tonight, and you're even considering this or thinking about this, I would just ask you that you, before you even take one more step, even tonight, I just wanted to even bring it to church. It's kind of different style for me, but the National Suicide Hotline is 1-800-273-HELP, 8255. And there are professionals on the other end of that phone that want to coach you and talk with you and provide you resources so that you can make it through this dark season. You don't have to die to end your pain. I thought tonight to try to help us I would tell you the story about this incredible prophet in the Old Testament. His name was Elijah, and Elijah, well, he was a fierce man of God, one of my favorite Bible characters for sure. And Elijah, if you don't know about him, man, his accolades and his resume, man, they're incredible. Like there's this one time he goes to this widow's house and her son has died, and Elijah's like, yo, not on my watch, and he, he resurrects the boy from, from death to life. Now, some of you think I've done this. I've never done this before. <laughs> I mean, this is like incredible stuff. There's another story that he gets fed by ravens out in the wilderness. He's like, oh, I'm so hungry. God's like, don't worry, I'm sending ravens. What? And ravens start dropping off food for him. <laughs> Could you imagine if you were hungry one day outside? You're like, oh my goodness, I'm so hungry. And God's like, here's some ravens. And they start dropping happy meals all over you. You're like, oh, thank you. <laughs> this is guy's life. Another story. There's a story in 1 Kings chapter 18 that he, he's in a foot race with a horse and he beats the horse. It's like Usain Bolt or something, bro. But my favorite story of Elijah is that Elijah, when he came to the end of his life, unlike anybody else in human history, there's a debate with Enoch, but other than Enoch, the only real evidence that we have through Scripture is the story of Elijah. Elijah never died. Instead, he was carried up in a chariot of fire to heaven. I don't know about you, but that's the way I want to go, yo. That sounds good right there. Just take me. Huh? It's like a little mermaid seat. Oh, oh. You start spinning, you know? Yet as we read all of his accolades and his resume, we find him in a peculiar spot in 1 Kings 19. We see him in a situation that is really unlike any other situation he's ever been in because he's in a place of such depression that he really wants his life to be taken from him. And you say, well, how did he get there? Well, in order to understand 1 Kings 19, which we read tonight, you have to understand 1 Kings 18. 1 Kings 18 happens to be like a scripture that's dear to my heart. For when I first started preaching at 17 years of age, I went on the road as a youth evangelist, and my first sermon as a youth evangelist was from 1 Kings chapter 18, and it was called Sold Out and Radical. That's a sermon title right there. Sold Out and Radical. And the reason why I called it that is because that's exactly who Elijah was. He shows up on Mount Carmel, and it's a showdown. He's the only man of God there. And at the time, people started worshiping false gods, Baal and Asherah. And there he, he has this showdown. Literally, he's like 800 prophets of Baal and Asherah. He's like, here's what we're going to do. We're going to find out today who the real God is. And he looks at all the people. He's like, how long are you going to waver between two opinions? If Baal's God, serve Baal. If Jehovah's God, serve him. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a showdown. You build your altar. I'll build my altar. Then we're both going to pray to our gods, and whoever, whoever's God is real will send fire down from heaven. I love Elijah. He's the man. He's like, you go first. <laughs> and so the scripture says that these guys, they start dancing around the altar. And the whole time while they're dancing around, this is my favorite part of Elijah. You got to go back and read this. First Kings chapter 18. He's trash talking them. <laughs> like literally, he's like, yo, ha ha. Ah, maybe your God's on vacation. Holler at your boy. Shout louder, and maybe he's using the restroom. Ah! 
Like typically when you're talking trash, you have a group of friends with you. Not Elijah. He's all alone trash talking 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah. And finally, as they go from morning to night, he's like, that's enough. My turn. The scripture says, I want to up the stakes. He goes, dig a ditch around the altar that I have. Go get jars of water. Pour it out three different times. So much water comes off the altar that it fills up the ditch. And Elijah, he doesn't dance. He doesn't sing. He doesn't cut himself. But rather, he prays a simple prayer. God, reveal yourself. And fire from heaven comes, licks up all the water. And that altar is set ablaze. And everyone that day bowed on their knees and said, your God is the real God. Come on, somebody. Let's give praise to a God who reveals himself. In classic Old Testament form, Elijah orders all of the prophets of Baal and Asher to be put to death. Aren't you thankful we don't live in the Old Testament anymore? <laughs> Kill them all! <laughs> and literally, he, he has all of these men put to death. And what's wild is that Elijah has his greatest achievement in ministry only to be followed by his greatest discouragement. I have learned over and over and over again that many times when you have a mountaintop experience, at some point you're going to have to step back down into the valley. And you have to prepare yourself for the valley. For you might be in this room tonight and life might feel like a mountaintop experience and everything is going right. You married the girl of your dreams and you've got kids on the way and business is awesome. And I am not trying to scare you tonight, but I do want to prepare you that life is full of peaks and troughs, ebbs and flows, mountaintops and valleys. And every one of us in this room, if we don't guard our heart and protect our mind, we are susceptible to be in the exact same place like Elijah was. The only way to counteract a lie is to give truth. And I see three truths that you need to understand from this text tonight. I want you to write these down. I'm going to go quickly. But I believe that as you get the truth in you, the Scripture says that when you know the truth, the truth shall set you free. Let me show you three truths from this text when it comes to this idea of depression and mental illness. Number one, the first thing that I see is that fear causes anxiety. Fear causes anxiety. Depression has a cousin. His name is anxiety. The other side of the coin from depression is always anxiety. Anxiety has this ability to stretch your soul thin and you feel out of control. Depression, on the other hand, is when you feel like your life is being constricted inward and darkness is enveloping over you. Typically, if you have any level of anxiety, depression will follow. If you have depression, anxiety is right around the corner. Right. I read this great quote. I think it's amazing. It says this. It says, having anxiety and depression is like being scared and tired at the same time. It's the fear of failure, but no urge to be productive. It's wanting friends, but hate socializing. It's wanting to be alone, but not wanting to be lonely. It's feeling everything at once than feeling paralyzing numb. This is a picture of what anxiety and depression at times feels like. Yet what I'm learning more and more in life is that it's fear that causes anxiety. Watch what happens in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 2. He just has this epic moment. He just has this great achievement, fire from heaven, people worshiping God, the prophets of Baal put to death, and here's what happens. The queen Jezebel, who was an evil woman, she heard what happened. So she sent a message to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Watch this. Elijah was, what's the word? Afraid. Elijah was what? Afraid. Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life. So this threat from Jezebel, Jezebel puts his life into a tailspin that he's running for his life. He's on the run because fear causes anxiety. And what you need to know is that when anxiety sets in, your thinking will always become faulty. Like, it's just the truth. Like, like your thinking is illogical. It's, it's like not normal thoughts. And what's happening to us is that we feel like we're out of control. And so we start making decisions that are silly, that are not smart. Like, for instance, the whole thing is kind of weird. Like, Jezebel says, I'm going to kill you. And so he's afraid Jezebel is going to kill him. So he says, God, would you kill me? Wow. Yep. What? What? Yeah. what? Are you afraid to die? 
I'm really afraid to die, so God, will you kill me? He, he's, he's so fearing death that he's decided he wants to die. No, I don't think he's afraid of death. What I think he's afraid of is that he's not in control of the outcome. And this is what anxiety does to us. Anxiety, it makes us feel out of control and we're trying to put things in order. And so often the very thing that we're afraid of, it's not even as bad as, the, as fear itself. Fear is always false evidence appearing real. And when you abide in fear, you're gonna always be running for your life. That's why we're the people of God and we focus on our faith because our faith always leads us to life and life more abundantly. See, you have to begin to decipher in life external versus internal. There are external components that you'll never, ever be able to be in control of. And whenever you start to put your focus on the external things, it leads to anxiety. What you have to do is you have to look within and focus on the internal things that you can control. Next week, we're talking on worry. And what I discovered about worry is that 90% of the things that you're worried about will never even happen. For 34 years, I've been worried about stuff. That never even happened. And so many of us today, our anxiety, it's stretching us thin. We're feeling out of control. You know, I've gone through different pain in my life and different obstacles in my life. And I've been through some real challenges. Yet this thing with anxiety, what's so strange about it is that sometimes it comes out of nowhere with the silliest stuff. A few years back, Don Shree and I, we were doing a reality show with the Oxygen Network, and at the time, it seemed like a big risk for us. We were sort of risking our reputation. We were being criticized, and we were trying to do something good in our heart, although many people didn't see that. And so here we were. We're trying to plant this church and document it. We go, this is going to be good. And I remember one of the episodes, they were going to do a surprise birthday party for me. Now, you know you're a control freak when you plan your own surprise party. <laughs> Guilty, you know. And something happened that night where there's 30, 40 people that I love so much. And to be honest with you, that they all love me so much. The safest place I could be in. Yet the plan was not going according to the schedule. And things were kind of getting out of control. And I don't know what happened, but somewhere in that night, I'm going, whoa. And I found myself getting away from the party and locking myself in a bathroom, sitting on a toilet. And I'm like, <sighs> I'm breathing heavy. And literally what I've learned in these moments of anxiety is that I have to stop listening to myself and I have to start talking to myself. I'm just being honest. So as God is my witness, I'm like, Rich, you're great. I'm like, look in the mirror, like, you can do this. Rich, you can handle this. Rich, this is not a big deal. Rich, this is going to pass. You're just fine. Everybody here loves you, Rich. Everybody here is for you. Rich, you're amazing. Rich, this too shall pass. And as I started talking to myself, instead of listening to myself, anxiety began to leave my body. Come on, somebody, if you know what I'm talking about. It's the fear of the unknown. It's the fear of being out of control. We must learn to talk to ourselves and focus on the internal things that we can control rather than the external things that we can't control. Fear causes anxiety. But number two, what I see is that depression detaches us from people. This is always a sign of depression. Isolation is not where you want to fight your battles from. You don't want to fight alone. God's remedy for so much in our life is people. Yet when I start getting anxious, I start getting illogical, and my thinking's faulty. Watch what happened to, to, to Elijah. He's on the run. He's running from his life. First Kings chapter 19, verse 3. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. Let me tell you, the one place you don't want to go alone, the wilderness! <laughs> came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. See, what happens is we start to get isolated. As we get isolated, we have all these new thoughts that come about. And some of you, you've been there before. You start saying to yourself, I'm so alone. I've never been more alone. Nobody understands me. Nobody gets me. I'm the only one to ever go through something like this. I'm a mess up. I'm a failure. I'd be better off not being here. Nobody would miss me. I'm all alone right now. Why would anybody care if I was gone? Here I am. I'm just alone. 
And we just keep feeding ourselves this toxic thinking. Look at what Elijah does. First Kings chapter 19, verse 10. This is what it says. He says, I, he's, he's talking to God. He's like, God, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left. What's he doing? He's comparing himself to everybody else around him. And his comparison is killing his contentment. And now they are trying to kill me too. This is a picture of what depression does. And what we must understand is that people are the solution. We cannot afford to go at it alone. I don't know what you're going through tonight, but you won't make it on your own. You need to open up your eyes and see that there are people all around you that care. But you have to open up your mouth. Nobody knows what you're going through if you don't say something. I wish I could get a witness at 6 p.m. on a Sunday night to help encourage some people to be bold tonight to walk into freedom. I don't know what kind of secrets you have in this place, but I know this. If nobody knows your secrets, you're in trouble. I'm not saying everybody's got to know your secrets. I'm saying somebody's got to know your secrets. For you will always be as sick as your secrets, and God will not heal what you continue to hide. You have to expose it. At Voodoo Church, we're constantly looking for ways to try to gather people. And I want to be loud and clear. There are resources for you. Like even this week, these guys got up here tonight and they're talking about Voo crews, 100 plus crews all over the place happening. And I'm telling you what, a crew is not a luxury. It is a necessity for your faith journey and for your health in your mind and your emotions. You need people. We won't make it without each other. We've never needed this community more than we need it right now. And the answers to our problems, so often they're sitting right here next to us. Yet if we don't reveal who we are, we won't find the help. Fear causes anxiety. Depression detaches us from people. But lastly, watch this. I want you to see this. You have to get up to discover your purpose. It's just the truth. These aren't lies. This is truth. The suicide deception, it becomes alluring, it becomes deceiving, so you counter that with truth. And the truth is, you have to get up to discover your purpose. Here's Elijah, and he's on borderline suicide watch. He's going, God, take my life, my life. I'm tired. I've had enough, God. I've had enough. I'm up to here, God. I can't take anymore. That's how some of you feel in this room, that your capacity is spent. You've got no more. You can't take any more on. I've had enough, Lord. That's where Elijah is. And you would think this great man of God, you think that God would show up and do some big supernatural spiritual thing to sustain him or to help him. But that's not what God does at all. In fact, look at what the scripture says, because this messed with me this week. First Kings chapter 19, verse five, Elijah lay down under the bush and fell asleep. And all at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then laid down again. The angel of the Lord came back. What does it say? Came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. Listen to me, and I want you to hear this with the right heart tonight. Some of us, we would be absolutely shocked to discover how many problems in our life would be solved if we would just consistently get eight hours of sleep at night. Wow. What? Yeah. Like literally. So many of us, we, we don't realize that our mental state and our emotions are always connected with our physical body. It's crazy. God sends an angel. That's supernatural. But the angel wakes Elijah up from his rest, from his nap. He's like, yo, bro, eat some food. Hark, eat some food. I made some bread over there, special bread. Eat that bread. Let's go. Get up. Get up, eat the food, go back to sleep. You see, there's, there's this rhythm. Those of us that have been depressed before, we know that what happens is, is that we wake up. And so often when we're in this state of depression, we just have no motivation to get out of the bed. 
We think, you know what I'll do? I'll just, I'll just lay. I'll just lay right here and I'll get some rest. But there is a big difference between rest and being lazy. For the rhythm of God is that you would rest and then you would get up. For if you just lay there, you'll never ever get the rhythm and the joy you're looking for. Rest has to be combated with you getting up. And it's a basic rhythm that if you'll obey the rhythm, so many times challenges and problems, they begin to subside when we simply say, all right, I'm going to get consistent rest and then I'm going to force myself to get back up. I'm going to eat some food, not fast food. I'm going to get some good food in my body. I'm going to rest again, get back up again, get some food, get some rest again, get back up again. Like, you don't have to die. It could be. I'm saying this. It could be. You just need to change your diet. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not giving a blanket answer there. I'm just saying it, it could be. Why not do what you can do before you ask God to do what he can do? There's just this, there's just this rhythm, just this rhythm, just this rhythm. I love that the angel puts him back to sleep. Like, no, 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 you're not, you're not ready. Get, get some, you need some rest, man. That was, whew, that was, a, that was a, quite an event. <laughs> get, get, get a little longer now. Like some of you, like you just, we live in a frantic pace. You're going and you're going and you're going and you're going. And you don't know why you feel so stretched. It's because you're not even sleeping. You're not even eating. And so all of a sudden you hit this wall and it's called depression. And then you go, I'm just going to lay here. And if I just lay here, I'll feel better. But you never feel better because it's not the rhythm of life. And the rhythm of life is that you work in the day and you sleep at night. And at night, God works on your behalf. But you got to get up. I love what the angel says. The angel says, yo, eat some more food because this journey you're about to go on is too hard for you. You know what it tells me? It tells me that I can't fight this battle in my own strength, that I am not enough, that God has not called me to do hard stuff. He's called me to do impossible stuff. And I need to obey him in the natural so that I can see him operate in the supernatural. It's amazing because Elijah, he gets up and he travels 40 days. He finds himself asleep in a cave. God wakes him up in a cave 40 days later and says, I'm going to reveal myself to you, Elijah. Go and hide yourself in the cleft of the mountain. And all of a sudden there, Elijah goes and he hides. And the scripture says that wind passes by, but God was not in the wind. And fire passes by, but God was not in the fire. And then right then, a still small voice, a gentle whisper, some translation says. And there, God began to speak to Elijah. I love the fact that he spoke to him in a whisper. The only reason why he whispered to him is because a whisper means that you're close. You can only hear it if you're close. And you need to realize tonight that even in your depression and anxiety and fear and worry, God is close to you. He's never left you. He has never left you. He's so close that he whispers your name. And it's amazing. He whispers to Elijah. Elijah says, no, God, I've been so zealous for you. And there's not anyone else righteous. I'm all alone. I'm depressed. You don't understand what I'm going through. And God says, actually, Elijah, you don't have all the facts. There's actually 7,000 righteous in Israel that I have reserved for myself. And Elijah, I want you to know that although you faced depression, it has not stopped your mission. And the fact that you got up means I still have a purpose for your life. And Elijah, your best days, they're not behind you. Your best days are in front of you. For I have a successor in mind. His name is Elisha. And you're to go and find him. And together you will see some of the greatest miracles occur. Elijah, the latter will be greater than the former. But as I look at Elijah's story, I realize that he had to get up to discover his purpose. I don't know what getting up looks like for you tonight because it means a lot of different things for people in this room. Some of you getting up means, all right, here I am. I got some challenges and I'm tired of being quiet about it. Others of you getting up means I'm fighting back. 
I'm going to a doctor. Getting up means I'm going back to counseling. Getting up says, all right, I'm going to start the medication again. Getting up says, I'm going to start serving at church. Getting up means I'm getting back into Vu Crew. Getting up is, you know what? Maybe I can get a job. Maybe God still can work with my life. Maybe my mission has not been destroyed by my depression. I'm getting up. You got to get up to find your purpose. God has a purpose for your life. But listen to me. Depression, anxiety, suicide, it will not solve itself. Because some of us were tempted. I'll just lay here and it will pass over me. I'm telling you, you will be in a vicious cycle forever. You have to get up to discover God has more purpose for you. I, um, I told you that um, this week was a challenging week for me. And it wasn't just because my iPhone died. This week has been a challenging week because my uncle, Greg, who I loved so much, he died on Tuesday. I got so many fond memories of my uncle Greg. His kids go to this church and help to start this church, Jeffrey and Jen. In fact, someone said, why are you wearing a suit? It's because I just came from the funeral an hour ago. My Uncle Greg, he fought a battle with lung cancer. And on Tuesday, we got a call that he wasn't doing good. And so Don Shrew and I, we went to the hospital at Mount Sinai. And there he was intubated. And for about an hour and a half, my wife and I, we just stood in that room and we prayed and we sang songs and we read psalms over him. And we went home hopeful. But a few hours later, we got a call that Uncle Greg had graduated to heaven. We drove back to the hospital. We walked into the room about 30 minutes after he had passed away. And there on that table was just a shell of my uncle. His body was there, but his life and his soul and his spirit was gone. Now today, we actually celebrate and we're actually joyful because we know that if you're in Christ Jesus, to be absent from the body means to be present with Jesus. We know that one day we will see him again, that we will walk on streets of gold and we will spend our life worshiping Jesus. And so there's great hope in that. In fact, from that hospital room, our family, we gathered around him and we begin to celebrate his life, begin to reflect on his life and we worship Jesus because we made a decision that we're gonna worship Jesus and declare that he's good, whether we're on the mountaintop or whether we're in the valley, who he is does not change. But I gotta be honest. I was sitting there, standing there, looking at my uncle and looking at his body. And I just had this thought come over my life that life is so short. Scripture says life is but a vapor. It's here one day and it's gone the next. It's like yesterday I was camping with Uncle Greg in Sacramento. It's like yesterday we were water skiing on the Ocoee River. And now I'm standing there looking at his lifeless body And the sobering thought comes over me that life is short, Rich. Life is short. And there's young people in this church today, and I want to remind you, life is short. It's too short to live depressed. It's too short to live anxious. And it's too short to struggle every day with thinking about taking your life. I want to challenge you tonight to get up. That you're not quitting tonight that one day it is appointed unto all men to die, but that is God's responsibility, not mine. And so I don't know who I'm preaching to tonight, but I want to say to you, get up. Your future is brighter than your past. I want to say to you in the balcony, get up. Your ladder is greater than your former. I want to say to every person in this room, get up because the best is still yet to come. I got to go who works miracles. Come on and worship him in this house.